The consequences of the battle were not fully played out as Sherman felt no need to seek retribution at the completion of the hearing. After the Civil War ended, the South was in serious trouble as Confederate money was worth nothing. Tennessee Governor Brown, though, angered the Confederates by placing blacks in power. Black Union soldiers were allowed to govern over their former masters, which inflamed the growing hatred even more. This radical northern action would only fuel the need for an organization for southerners to feel like they were safe and had control of their communities again. This organization would be a fraternal organization of men, the Ku Klux Klan. The Invisible Knights of the Ku Klux Klan was formed in December of 1865 in the law office of Judge Thomas M. Jones. They formed this organization in Giles County in Pulaski, Tennessee. General Forrest was asked to lead the Ku Klux Klan by Captain Morton, one of Forrest artillery officers during the war. General Forrest and other responsible leaders in the Klan, which at the time included more than a dozen Confederate generals. These men met with Brownlow's committee in 1868 to head off an inevitable bloodbath. The KKK was not the only organization of this sort. There were many other organizations in the South trying to prevent the Negro population from voting. The White Camellia, the Pale Face League, the Shotgun Club, and the Council on Safety. But of course, the most ominous was the KKK. The Klan of the 1860s can be compared with the Sons of Liberty. And it can also be compared with the black civil rights movement in the 1950s and 60s. Because blacks then violated a lot of southern laws that had not at that time been declared unconstitutional. And blacks then wanted to enroll every black they possibly could to vote. They wanted the right to vote. The Ku Klux Klan and Forrest wanted the ex-Confederates to also have their civil rights. He's a part of our history which we can't deny. It's much as slavery, we can't deny it or overlook it and neglect it. We have to use it and grow from it. He's not a person I would think would want to have had dinner with me or would have enjoyed spending an evening with me. But I certainly can learn from the egregious errors that he made, in many ways, the egregious errors that men of his time might have made. One of the radical actions that the Klan made against black prisoners was they stormed jails, dragged Negroes out and lynched them. They cut out their hearts and fed them to the dogs. These sort of barbaric action forced Forrest to disband the Klan in 1869. When Forrest disbanded the Klan, he ordered the members to burn their garments. You would think this was the end of the Klan. Forty-five years later, we couldn't have been more wrong. The premier of D.W. Griffith's The Birth of a Nation in 1915 brought the Klan to light again. By 1924, the Invisible Empire had reached four million members. Only the direction or motives of the men were now directed toward non-whites, Jews, Catholics, and foreigners. The Klan virtually disappeared prior to World War II, 
but it became more active after the Supreme Court decision to desegregate in 1954. In the year 1875, Forrest was asked to speak at a function in which Miss Lou Lewis presented Forrest with a bouquet of flowers and stated, Please allow me to present this bouquet of reconciliation and offering of peace and goodwill. Miss Lewis, ladies and gentlemen, I accept these flowers as a token of reconciliation between the white and colored races of the South. This is a proud day for me, having occupied the position I have for 13 years and being misunderstood by the colored race. I take this occasion to say that I am your friend. Forrest even made a contribution, a substantial contribution, to the erection of uh, the Beale Street Baptist Church here in Memphis, which of course was one of the earlier black churches that were, were built here in Memphis. I'm excited to hear and see members of my generation talk about a healing process between the races and genders. And I would say Forrest, in the last few years of his life, had a more enlightened attitude toward the black people than most other Southerners did. Now a major general, Forrest spent the first part of 1864 recruiting and resting. Forrest, like his fellow Southerners, was outraged about the news of a mass recruitment of black volunteers. The majority of these soldiers were, in fact, former slaves. Uh, slavery, of course, was the underlying or the underpinning element of the Southern economy. Consequently, it was incapable of financing the war. The other thing, of course, is that the presence of black Union Army soldiers helped to dispel the myth of white supremacy. He first faced these freshly trained black soldiers with eagerness in their hearts to prove their worth while attacking a Union fort in Paducah, Kentucky. Forrest's command rode straight into the cannons of the first Kentucky colored heavy artillery, containing 274 men, making up one third of the federal soldiers stationed at the fort. They contained Forrest's troops and almost destroyed an entire Kentucky regiment. But the courage of the colored troops did not go unnoticed. The Union fort commander was very impressed by their actions against the invading Confederate army. Allow me to remark that I have been one of those men who never had much confidence in colored troops fighting. But those doubts are now all removed, for they fought as bravely as any troops in the fort. Colonel Stephen Hicks, March 25th, 1864. It was thought, of course, that black soldiers were incapable of adequately fighting off uh, white troops who were, in many instances, somewhat better trained. But they had no less valor, if you will, in terms of fighting for the things with which they, with which they fought for. Forrest and his men felt it was simply irritating to be repelled by such a force, especially after Hicks refused Forrest's terms of surrender. 